Hi, my name is Sam Barlow. I'm a family medicine physician, um, and I was uh, asked to give a talk, um, a lecture today, about the importance of good sleep habits, or in other words, sleep hygiene. So just before we, we get started, I just wanted to uh, remind you all that um, yeah, at the end of the lecture, I'd like to go through some of uh, your questions, um, and uh, but we'll go ahead and get started now, and then um, we'll I'll get to those in, um, after, after I finish this. So the, the goals for today, um, we're gonna, the, you know, the eventual goal is to go over all of the, uh, the different types of things we can do for sleep hygiene. Um, but we'll kind of start off with going over some common types of in, insomnia and reasons for that. Um, some current treatments for insomnia and how um, efficacious those are and then also learning that some of the research behind sleep hygiene. And then, but obviously the most important thing is really just understanding how to implement sleep hygiene. So um, we spend a lot of time sleeping. Um, on average, humans spend a third of their lives sleeping. Um, so, you know, if the average uh, life expectancy is around 75 years, you know, you spend about 25 years of that sleeping, so. It's uh, definitely a huge part of our lives um, and very important on our overall health. So why do we sleep and why is it important that we sleep well? So there's been a lot of different research um, that's gone into showing the benefits of sleep and the detrimental effects of not getting enough of it. Um, so, you know, s s um, to simplify, you know, for optimal physical health is why we sleep. Um, basically, sleep heals our body. Um, there's been numerous studies that shown um, when we have uh, too short of amount of sleep, short sleep duration has been associated with increased cardiovascular disease, such as heart attack and stroke, as well as obesity, and overall just all-cause mortality. So uh, generally, the less sleep, um, the less healthy we are. Um, also, sleep has a big, um, big impact on our immune function, so um, preventing infection, disease, uh, many different types of infection disease, as well as also preventing cancer as well, too. Um, uh, the way our immune system works um, and cancer can sometimes develop is, you know, basically, um, you know, with UV rays for skin cancer or any um, basically different um, harmful materials uh, with other types of body cancers. Um, our our body basically um, has micro cancer, we would like to call it, um, and it basically as, you know, um, as those micro, as you're, as you're living, your immune system is, is kind of dealing with those micro cancers, um, usually the immune system is able to kind of overcome those um, and heal those kind of as you go, but um, uh, when your body isn't able to, that's when it actually be, uh, turns into, you know, a full-fledged cancer. Um, another thing that's, that sleep is very uh, good for is for mental health, um, preventing anxiety, depression. Um, and then uh, last of all, um, you need enough sleep to, um, to uh, function throughout your day, to focus enough, um, and then also sleep has been um, getting enough sleep has been shown to uh, prevent dementia and and the adverse um, and the opposite of that not getting enough sleep um, has been shown to uh, people getting dementia a little bit earlier. Um, so how much sleep do we need? Um, the National Sleep Foundation recommended that adults aged 18 to 64 years get seven to nine hours of sleep um, and for elderly individuals greater than 65 um, at least seven to eight hours of sleep. And then for infants, uh, children, teenagers, they need substanti substantially more sleep than adults. Um, you know, sometimes you know, nine to twelve to fifteen hours, depending on how how young you are. Um, you know, infants sleeping you know much of the day, and then teenagers you know sleeping around, uh, need, needing around uh, nine or ten hours sometimes. Um, however, n uh, nearly thirty percent of adults in the U.S. report sleeping. Uh, six or a few hours per day, so um, a good a good portion um, of adults in the U.S. aren't aren't really getting as much as they need. 
And then what is insomnia? So, you know, to simplify, ins insomnia is just any type of problem with sleep. Um, and then we would sort of distinguish that from sleep insufficiency as um, they can kind of be lumped together somewhat, but um, to differentiate those a little bit is sleep insufficiency is when a person isn't getting enough restful sleep. Um, may, they may be working long hours, taking care of family members, or dealing with other prob health problems that um, aren't able to let them get restful sleep. Um, and so insomnia really isn't about the amount of hours of sleep necessarily, um, because everyone does need a different amount of sleep. Some people are more, you know, on the seven, seven hour um, side of the spectrum, and then some people may need eight or nine before they can really function at their, their peak performance. Um, if, we're go if we can uh, distinguish even a little bit more between insomnia is you have acute insomnia and chronic insomnia. So acute insomnia or short-term uh, insomnia is basically just um, a very recent or short amount of time where you're having trouble with sleep, so days to weeks. Um, this is usually related to temporary stress in your life um, and often gets better on its own. And then chronic insomnia or long-term insomnia is three or more months of insomnia. And that um, usually needs some type of lifestyle change or um, treat ther treatment with therapy or medication. Um, and then to talk a little bit more about different types of insomnia or reasons that people can have for falling asleep, um, which, you know, and it is very important to distinguish between these because, you know, if, uh, if your doctor is unable to really figure out um, the source for the insomnia, um, it's, it's a lot harder to treat it specifically and, and effectively. So, um, you know, the first part, you know, one of the things that can go, kind of go wrong with sleep is trouble falling asleep. Um, a lot of times depression, anxiety can contribute to this. Um, if, if you've had a traumatic event, like a loss of a loved one, sometimes that can contribute to that as well. As well as uh, many types of pain, chronic pain from arthritis or back pain, things like that. Um, and then another, another side of insomnia as well is uh, trouble staying asleep trouble staying asleep. So, you know, people waking up uh, in the middle of the night because uh, they have to urinate. Um, sometimes people with prostate issues can um, uh, wake up multiple times and so not, not getting as much restful sleep because you're breaking up the sleep cycles. Um, sometimes, you know, if uh, with pregnancy, with, uh, uh, with like um, back pain having to do with pregnancy, or, you know, a newborn baby, basically sort of life changes, kind of waking you up in the night. Sometimes that can, that can contribute, as well as restless leg syndrome. Um, and then sometimes even with uh, menopause, um, you know, causing night sweats, things like that. Um, and then another, another one, um, COPD, not, e not being able to breathe as well, that can kind of wake you up and uh, alter the sleep cycle somewhat. Um, and then, uh, the, last, the last part of this is waking up from sleep and not feeling rested or falling asleep during daytime. So this can be um, if you are not having, um, like on the previous slide, um, if you are having like sleep insufficiency. So basically um, the sleep quality is not what it should be. So you're getting your seven, eight hours, whatever, but um, it's not really healing your body um, like it should. So sometimes sleep apnea can cause this. Um, uh, narcolepsy or some thyroid issues. Um, some symptoms of insomnia um, uh, could be forgetting things, getting cranky, anxious, depressed, or having less energy, interest uh, with activities. So a lot of things similar to if you have a diagnosis of anxiety or depression. Um, so a good bit of overlap there. Um, then also some other symptoms, making mistakes or accidents. And then sometimes even just worrying about lack of sleep, which can kind of cause a vicious cycle as well too, and not being able to fall asleep. And basically, um, if this is really affecting your relationships with your family, friends, or your work life, is when we want to, to treat this. 
Um, so so um, as we do get older, um, older adults tend to, to go to sleep um, earlier and get up earlier. Um, so sometimes this can be due to, you know, uh, elderly individuals uh, retiring, so not having a fixed schedule like they used to. Um, sometimes this can lead to problems um, such as delayed sleep phase order, disorder, so taking naps throughout the day, not being as, as sleepy at nighttime, waiting in bed um, to fall asleep, and, you know, after a few hours falling asleep, um, you know, waking up, uh, waking up a little bit early to the, to the sun and so not really getting all that sleep right now. So basically becoming a, a night owl. Um, and then as, as doctors, how do we in evaluate insomnia? So um, I thought this would uh, be beneficial just to kind of know, you know, what's going, what's going through our heads, um, how we evaluate this, um, and then uh, the next step, how, how we would treat this. Um, so before we treat it, we have to really distinguish between um, what's going on. So sometimes you can have uh, medications that can cause a side effect. So changing the medication or changing when you take the medication um, or even discontinuing the medication and trying, trying a different medication can actually treat the insomnia. And so you wouldn't have to, um, you, could, you could just treat it there and you wouldn't have to do different types of things. Um, so insomnia is a clinical diagnosis. Um, so that meaning you don't necessarily need to do lab work or any tests like sleep study to actually diagnose this. Um, however, those, those sometimes can be beneficial. So things we, we could do to evaluate insomnia is check, do a complete blood count, routine chemistries, thyroid function tests. Um, sometimes abnormalities in the like in the electrolytes or the blood, uh, different types of blood cells or thyroid levels can can uh, could cause problems with sleep. Um, and then we we're just talking about the different medications. So sometimes antidepressants, um, which uh, uh, can cause insomnia, so that can be a side effect in 20% of patients. Um, sometimes uh, taking steroids, chronic steroids, can cause problems with sleep. Um, and then uh, stimulants, um, such as you know, treating ADHD, like Ritalin. Um, uh, we try to take those earlier during the day, um, or sometimes can change them from long acting to a more intermediate or sh short acting, so you're, you're able to fall asleep. Um, and, then one of the, and then one of the last ones, which is a fairly common one, is opioid. And basically what op opioids do is they, they can help with pain but a side, common side effect is decreasing your uh, respiratory function, so your breathing. And so some, sometimes when we do this, um, it can cause nocturnal awakenings due to changes in res respiration, basically leading to fragmenting your sleep cycle um, and not giving you enough restful sleep. And so um, a sleep study is kind of one, one of the big things that we can do to evaluate insomnia, and especially um, for sleep apnea. And so this test is a test that lasts all night long. It can be done at home or in a sleep lab. Um, basically, you have monitors attached to your body to study um, uh, different um, uh, aspects of your ph physiology to see how well you're sleeping. Um, and then also, we have sleep medicine specialists um, if your primary care doctor isn't able to um, fully take care of this on his own, his or her own. Um, and so how do we treat insomnia? So um, the, the thing that we're, you know, the focus for today is sleep hygiene, and we'll get into that on the next, the next slide, but um, there's different relaxation, relaxation exercises um, that you can do sort of in conjunction with sleep hygiene, such as progressive muscle relaxation, um, diaphragmatic breathing, mindfulness, which is being present in the moment and aware of physical sensations, thoughts, and emotions. And then also the actual first line treatment for insomnia is CBT or cognitive behavioral therapy. So for chronic uh, insomnia, usually this is the first thing that we wanna do um, in addition to sleep hygiene before we really start a medication. And this basically involves um, learning sleep hygiene and relaxation exercises. Um, and really just changing sort of negative thinking patterns that are, that are not helping us sleep. 
Um, and then, kind of like we discussed earlier, you know, uh, to treat insomnia, sometimes we just have to treat the other medical conditions that's contributing to this. And then a, quest, a common question is, should I use alcohol to help me sleep? Um, uh, the the uh, simple answer is no. It, it'll make you sleepy, but it basically decreases your sleep quality because it disrupts um, your sleep later in the night. Um, some medications used to treat insomnia. Um, basically, the point of this slide is there's a lot of different medications, some that we used in the past that we that we try not to use as much now, but basically all these medications have a lot of side effects and we try not to use them unless we have to. Um, the first one is, uh, has to do with benzodiazepines. So these are a sedative hypnotic type of thing. Um, uh, so there's different, different types of them, but basically Ambien would be, uh, or Zolpidem would be a uh, type of this. Um, uh, this can have side effects of like um, having unusual or unsafe behaviors like eating, driving, or having sex basically after going to the sleep, and then the, the person will have no memory of this. So um, not ideal, but sometimes we have to use these types of medications. Um, then the next one is a dual orexin receptor antagonist, common side effect being drowsiness, so um, affecting driving safety, job performance, decision making. So. A lot of these things are not ideal, so we try to avoid them if we can. Um, then we have melatonin receptor agonists like Remelteon. This is basically works like uh, melatonin. will basically increase the levels of melatonin in your brain. Um, so this is good because it's not habit, fo habit forming, and it's better you know, for people who are having fa difficulty falling asleep. But you do have some side effects, um, such as uh, dizziness, fatigue, nausea as well. And then antihistamines such as Benadryl, doxylamine, little evidence for these, and we try to avoid these in the elderly because they can cause confusion. Um, and then um, the, last, the last part of this is melatonin, which we talked about a little bit, is, um, is the over-the-counter over melatonin. So melatonin is a hormone normally produced in the brain. Um, when, uh, when the sun goes down or the lights go out, basically your pineal gland in your brain starts to increase uh, the levels of melatonin and that, that contributes to um, having that sleepy feeling. We, um, we know that it's safe if you're using it less than three months based on current research for that. But with any over-the-counter um, um, su supplement, um, the ingredients, dose, and purity aren't regulated, so. Okie doke, so we've talked a good bit about, you know, the dif different types of treatments, evaluation, um, different reasons uh, of how we can have insomnia, but, you know, the real thing that we, uh, that we, that I wanted to talk about is really what is sleep hygiene. And kind of the things we've talked about already um, will we'll serve to reinforce this a little bit. Um, so number one is really use, only using the bedroom for sleep and sex. And basically the idea is you don't want to do anything that's going to remind you of work or stress and basically prevent you from relaxing and falling asleep. And so that's the, that's the first and probably most important one. Um, another one is you don't um, uh, want to have any screens in your bedroom. So any type of screen, whether it's a TV, um, ebook, cell phone, tablet, laptop, these all have blue light and that basically keeps your pineal gland um, uh, from producing melatonin. So try to have all of these things outside of the room if you can. Um, creating a regular sleep, sleep schedule time, going to bed at a certain time, waking up at a certain time, and then in addition to this, having a relaxing bedtime routine, whether you know, it's taking a shower or a bath, um, doing some of these uh, uh, muscle relaxation exercises, reading a, uh, reading a book, some, whatever basically works for you to kind of relax you. Uh, we also say not to uh, exercise or eat late at night because, you know, your stomach's going to be, stomach intestines are working on digesting that food. Also, the exercise really just um, kind of stimulate your mind and prevent you from falling asleep as fast. But you do want to have regular exercise, so preferably during midday or morning, because that'll help you um, 
fall asleep better and have better, more restful sleep. Um, and, and I like to say avoid the big three, so alcohol, caffeine, and smoking. Um, um, avoid them, period, if you can, but especially in the afternoon and evening. Um, alcohol decreases your sleep quality. Uh, ca caffeine um, is a stimulant, so coffee, tea, soda, definitely want to avoid those in the afternoon and evening. And then smoking as well, as that's a stimulant. Avoid taking naps during the day, um, because that can in turn you know, make you not as tired. So it'll, it's basically like, you know, kind of treat it, treat it like jet lag. Um, basically try to stop taking naps and then it'll, you'll be more tired that day, but eventually you'll be able to go to bed earlier. And then you definitely want to keep the bedroom cool, dark, and quiet. So sometimes using blackout shades or sometimes uh, you can use a fan, white noise, or earplugs. And then something that's very important as well, um, if you can't fall asleep in 20 minutes, basically get up from your excuse me, get up from your bed, try to go to another room, um, and do some type of relaxing activity. And then avoid try you know doing sort of rewarding activities like housework, TV, studying, eating things that will kind of stimulate you and kind of keep having you do those. Um, and so we. We may not have uh, quite enough time to go through the different progressive muscle relaxations, but best basically just to, to sum this up, is you, you're, you're re relaxing your muscles from your head all the way down to your feet. And you're basically um, contracting the muscles um, one by one. Um, and this basically just uh, helps you um, relax uh, mentally as f and physically as well. And then also diaphragm breathing, basically putting one hand on the chest, other on the belly, breathing through your nose. Um, and basically you do this count one to 10 backwards from 10 to one. And this basically focusing on the breathing um, helps all the other muscles relax as well as your mind relax. And then um, I'm gonna skip the, the jet lag. Um, that probably doesn't have as much weight with this lecture. Um, but uh, to conclude and have some takeaway pearls, I'd like to go over these and then we can kind of go over some questions if there are any. Um, so it is crucial that we get seven to nine hours of sleep nightly um, to have enough energy for the day let our body and let our bodies heal in order to prevent disease. Um, if, if you do have insomnia, the first thing to try is these different, um, those one through eight things that we talked about for sleep hygiene. Um, due to most sleep medicines having unwanted side effects, we try to avoid medication um, initially unless necessary. Um, and then a short list, basically just to remind you guys um, f of the different things for sleep hygiene. Um, using a bedroom for sleep and sex, no screens in the bedroom, regular sleep schedule and routine, no late eating or exercise, avoid caffeine, alcohol, smoking in the PM, avoid naps, and you want to keep the bedroom cool, dark, and quiet. And then last, you know, don't lie in bed for more than 20 minutes. And then these are my sources here, um, uh, mainly pulled from up to date um, as well as this article here. But I'd like to thank, um, thank you guys all for your, uh, for your attention so far, and then we'll go ahead and go over some of these questions. Okay, so. Is it just this, just this one? Okay. Um, so I got a question here. Um, okay. I went off HRT two weeks ago after 15 years and haven't slept well since. Will it eventually improve? About how long would it take? Thank you. And HRT, what is that referring to? Oh, hormone, yeah. Hormone replacement therapy, okay. Okay, so uh, so this is probably dealing with um, menopause um, after going off of hormone replacing ther uh, therapy for menopause um, and having some some issues since then. Likely, um, my first my first thought for this is if it's only been two weeks, um, I think it will improve. However, in the meantime. Um, I would definitely suggest trying sleep hygiene at first and talking 
talking with your uh, primary physician so they can kind of go through a full evaluation of this. Um, I think it will eventually improve, but um, it will require definitely some sleep, you know, working on sleep hygiene and potentially um, some other, you know, evaluation, whether it be um, sleep study or potentially trying a different medication. Um, how long would it take to improve? It's hard to say ex exactly. Some, you know, some people might take a little bit, you know, longer than others. So I would definitely follow up with your primary care physician so they can really tailor it towards you. Um, but that brings up a really good point, ba um, basically how a lot of this insomnia um, problems, any problems with sleep is just so tailored to the individual. Um, we, we kind of, as a blanket, we say, work on these sleep hygiene things first, and then, then we kind of consider medication and things like that after it. But I would definitely recommend trying, you know, those one through eight type of steps we talked about today. And then really, if that's not working, um, you know, talk, um, and in the meantime, definitely talking with your physician to come up with a plan for you, though. Is there any other questions? Okay. Um, thanks again, uh, you, uh, you guys, for all of your time. Um, I hope this was, uh, was helpful for you. And uh, uh, yeah, thanks again.